Good morning. Again, we want to acknowledge to our Father and our God in heaven that we are grateful for all of his love, mercy, and blessings. Uh, when we consider God's person, God's character, and God's creation, uh, the, ne the necessary result is to praise him. Uh, when you consider God's person, the holiness of his person is seen in all that we can know about him uh, as he has revealed himself to us in his word. Uh, when we consider God's character, the grace and mercy of his character is seen in his dealings with humanity. And when we consider God's creation, uh, the depth and love of his power is manifested in the work of his hands. Uh, thus, God is worthy to be praised by our lips and in our living. The psalmist declares in Psalm 103, verse 22, Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Uh, God has not only blessed the universe, God has blessed us individually. And he has blessed us uh, primarily in spite of us. And when we consider God's goodness, God's grace, and God's mercy, uh, then surely we want to praise him. And for all of God's blessings, we ought to be eternally grateful. Delighted to see in our audience this morning, when she came in, she said, excuse me, sir. And I, I, I turned around and get ready to look, you know, who are you saying excuse me to, to see uh, our good friend, uh, really more than a friend, a family. Uh, our good friend we know from Cambridge, uh, we uh, refer to her and her husband, Marco, as our favorite neighbors. Uh, and even though we don't live in Cambridge anymore, they're still among our favorites. And so good to see uh, Vicki Harris in our audience uh, this morning. Uh, glad to have her uh, with us. We want to direct your attention again to 1 Kings chapter 19, uh, the text that was read into our hearing. We want to read again there verse 9 and verse 13. 1 Kings 19, verse 9, And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Again in verse 13, So it was, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Based on the account recorded for us in 1 Kings 19, we want to use this morning as a subject, what are you doing here? And as we consider uh, the text that we have before us here in 1 Kings 19, I submit to you that the events of 1 Kings 18 and 19 are a microcosm of the flow of life. And by that, we mean to say that life has its share of victories and defeats, its share of mountains and valleys. In chapter 18, we read that Elijah, having stood for God, was victorious over the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Uh, you remember the showdown that they had there, and the challenge from Elijah was, let the God who answers by fire be God. Of course, the prophets of Baal received no answer because their gods were false gods, uh, but God responded by fire. And you recall that after that, that Elijah gathered all the prophets of Baal and killed them with the sword. Now, the news that he had slain the prophets of Baal was relayed to Jezebel. Now, that's important because the prophets of Baal were Jezebel's prophets. 
So when Jezebel hears that not only has Elijah defeated her prophets, but he's killed them on top of it, uh, she threatens Elijah's life. And really her threat was more one of those, uh, uh, as my mother used to say, was more, uh, uh, you know, one of those, that's not a threat, that's a promise. Uh, uh, You read there in verse 2, then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, now watch how specific she is. You know, threats can kind of be vague, but Jezebel's very specific. So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. She tells Elijah, I'm going to get you, sure enough, and it ain't going to be long before I do. Now, when Elijah hears the threat, His reaction is articulated to us in verse number three. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Now, it's not stated why he left his servant, but but I've always speculated you know, Elijah's trying to make time. Was his servant slowing him down and he just figured he could run better uh, 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 without the servant uh, uh, in tow? But the text relates to us that Elijah went from a mountain experience to a valley ordeal in this event. And, and life can be like that. You can be experiencing uh, a, a prosperous time in one breath and a life-shaking trial uh, in the next. Uh, You know, one day you you can receive news from the job that uh, uh, you've been promoted and your pay is going to be raised, and then the next day the doctor give you uh, uh, some of that head-shaking news. As we examine this event in Elijah's life, Uh, I I, I try to remember it's easy to give a critical analysis of someone else when removed from the heat of adversity or persecution. You know, it's easy to read now, years removed from what happened, and say Elijah should have done this, that, or the other. But the real question is, what would I have done uh, 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 if I was there? Now, you know, I, I used to be a runner. You know, Elijah, if you're going to run, come on, that's my thing. I, I'm going to run with you. In fact, I'm going to wait for you. Just let me know where you're going, and, and I'll be there when you get there. So I, I believe it's more profitable to consider how God can turn our lack in, into his glory rather than to find fault with Elijah. As we read uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, The the biblical account relates to us that ultimately Elijah came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Uh, uh, Verse 8, so he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, uh, the mountain of God. Now, Mount Horeb is also known as Mount Sinai. Uh, uh, They one in the same, the, the, the mountain of God. And we may be more familiar with this mountain because it was on Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, uh, that God first appeared to Moses. Now, you know Moses' story, even as ju- just from seeing the movie. Now, now, the movie is not accurate in all its details, but it, you know who Moses was. Well, well, Moses received the Ten Commandment law and, and and all the other uh, accompanying instructions uh, on Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. Now, usually in Exodus, uh, the book of Exodus is referred to as Mount Sinai, but in Deuteronomy it tends to be referred to as Mount Horeb, but but it's the same mountain. So in verse 9, God asked Elijah uh, a question. What are you doing here, Elijah? And and when we consider the question that God asked of Elijah, uh, uh, two things have to be remembered. Uh, The first is God never asked a question seeking information. God wasn't asking Elijah to tell him what he was doing there. It, It was really one of those 
You know, when a kid gets in trouble at school and the parent calls home and tells the parents what have happened, and by the time the child gets home, the, the parent asks him, what happened at school today? Well, I'm not asking you what happened at school today looking for information. I know what happened at school today because the teacher has already called. But, but what I want to do is I want to see what you have to say uh, about what happened at, at school today. But also, the second thing, the fact that God asked the same question a second time indicates to us that Elijah, and this after the demonstration of God's power in the wind, the earthquake, and the fire, Elijah still needed clarification and guidance. And appreciate, when you ask the question, what are you doing here, uh, uh, that it can have different contexts. It, it doesn't always refer uh, 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 to one's physical location. It, it can have reference to my mental or, or emotional state. You, you ever heard somebody say, I'm just not in a good place right now? Now, now that's not referring to where they are physically. Well, what they're telling you that their current frame of mind uh, uh, it, it is not the best. So what are you doing here? could have, I think, three relevant contexts in this account. Elijah did not appreciate where he was providentially. He did not have to be where he was emotionally. And he did not know where he had come purposefully. Now, as we look at 1 Kings chapter 19, look again at verse number 5. The, the Bible says, then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. Now remember, he's running from Jezebel. Now, it's not uncommon when you're taking a trip to pack things that you need for the trip. But I don't get the impression that this time Elijah packed things before he took off. I, I, I think he just got the word that Jezebel wanted his head and he just took off running. Uh, you know, when, when I travel, invariably I'll forget something. So, you know, sometimes people even have a little checklist. You know, I, I need my toothbrush and I need my comb and I need this, that, or the other. It, whatever is suitable for, for the trip that you're taking. I, I don't think this is one of those trips where Elijah packed before he went. I, I think he just took off running but notice the angel says, arise and eat. Well, eat what? I didn't bring any food with me. But look at verse 6. Then he looked. See, that, that, that lends credence to the idea. He hadn't packed any food. He looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Elijah must have did some powerful hard running. He goes to sleep again. And I know after a good meal, uh, you know, sleep kind of comes to you. But, you know, he ate bread and water. I, and, and, you know, beggars can't be choosers. But, but bread and water is not, you know, first class fare. That's, I mean, it'll keep you going. But it is not what you order when you go to a restaurant. And then in verse 7, and the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. Now, the first time he just said, arise and eat. This time he says, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. I know where you're going and you haven't even got there yet. So when God asked him, what are you doing here? God knows what he's doing there. I Elijah doesn't appreciate what he's doing there. So he arose and ate and drank and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God. If the question is asked, what are you doing here? Uh, Elijah had overmissed the fact that he was under the care of the divine. I, I submit to you that Elijah was where he was physically and emotionally because he had not embraced where he was providentially. Now, now by that, I'm, we are always under God's care. 
Now, things happen, and, and I don't want to make light of anybody's adversity. You, you know, tough times are just that. they tough times. You, if you, you know, your money is funny or, or the doctor has given you that bad news and you're living with a chronic condition or maybe you're living in a troubled home, those things are not to be, you know, brushed off lightly. Uh, 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 the, the, there is hardship in having to live with those things. But God doesn't stop being God simply because we go through tough times. And God didn't stop being God simply because Jezebel had threatened his life. Now, now when I say simply, again, I don't want to take that light. I mean, I, I, I've never had anybody really threaten my life. I mean, I've been threatened, but I, I, I don't think anybody really wanted to kill me, not kill me, kill me. You know, sometimes folk mad at you and they may use that language and want to strike you. But I, I don't know that I've had anybody that really wanted to take me out. But I submit to you that it was Elijah's thinking, not God's command, that moved him to run from Jezebel. And, and again, I say circumstances are not a sure indicator of our reality. See, circumstances are just looks like, but looks can be deceiving. You, you ever been attracted to somebody based on what they looked like? And then after you got to know them, they didn't look like as much as they looked like at first. See, looks can be deceiving. Our circumstances may look like we've had it, but remember, God is always in control. Now, to be clear, let me say that when we are under the providential care of God, it doesn't mean that we'll get the outcome that we want. You know, you, you can still go through some tough times even though God is in control. But, but you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? It looked like they were in trouble. Nebuchadnezzar was going to throw them in a fiery furnace. Now, if you ever read Hebrews, sometimes God let the look like be, be like. You know, that ain't just what it looked like, that's what it be like. Sometimes God allowed that to happen, but God is always in control. When we say we are under the providential care of God, it, it means that nothing happens except it be by God's determined or God's permissive will. You remember the words of the apostle Romans 8 verse 31? He says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Why are you saying that, Paul? Because nothing happens unless it is in agreement with the determined or the permissive will uh, of God. And when you read uh, chapter 19, one of the things that, that said, you know, Ahab and Jezebel were not new to Elijah's acquaintance uh, uh, at the time of the threat. They had opposed him uh, you know, throughout his ministry. If you look at chapter 18, uh, verse number 17, then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, is that you, O troubler of Israel? Now, even if you don't know anything about their history, for Ahab to refer to Elijah as the troubler of Israel says that they have a negative history. And, and then keep on reading. Look how uh, Elijah answered Ahab. Now, now I'm a paraphrase. He, he said, I'm not the one that's troubling Israel. It is you with your old wicked self, uh, henpecked by your old evil wife. Now, now he didn't say all of that. I, I'm kind of ad-libbing some. But, but, but the text surely declares to us that that, that was the case uh, uh, in their relationship. Uh, you, you see back in uh, uh, verse 1 of chapter 19, Ahab told Jezebel, well, Jezebel is the queen, but, but Ahab, you the king. Well, why are you telling Jezebel? Because she wear the pants in this family. I'm just, uh, you know, when I wanted Naboth's vineyard, she, she came up with a plan uh, 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 for me to get it. Uh, uh, Ahab, you know, if you henpeck, you just put Ahab's picture next to it. But not only was Elijah under the care of the divine, but if we consider the question in another context, what are you doing here? Here, where? Where, where was he at the time? I, I submit to you that 
uh, Elijah was in the cave of despair. In verse 9, there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. Now, mind you, he by himself. You, you know, when, 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 when something uh, discouraging or unpleasant happens to you, the worst thing you can do is run off by yourself and, and, and just, you know, feel sorry for yourself. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, watch despair take over. Now, despair, by definition, is the complete loss or absence of hope. And I submit to you that based on his words and his actions, this was a time of despair for Elijah. And appreciate, despair can be dangerous because despair will influence us to distort reality, speak inaccurately, and act faithlessly. Faithlessly. You ever listen to somebody talk when they're full of despair? You know the kind of thing people say when they're full of despair? Nobody loves me. Nobody cares about me. Really, in this whole universe, nobody cares about you? You, you mean even God doesn't care about you anymore? You don't have one friend, one family member that, that, that cares about you? See, that's despair talking. And despair distorts reality. Well, now, watch what uh, uh, Elijah has to say. I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. And he had. The children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, and they had. Torn down your altars, they did, and killed your prophets with the sword. Well, now, Jezebel had a lot to do with the prophets being killed by the sword, and Jezebel was not an Israelite. But then watch what he says. I alone am left. Out of all the people in the world, Lord, you don't have but one servant left, and that's me. Really, Elijah? There ain't but one person that want to serve God left, and that's you. And you running from, from Jezebel. And they seek to take my life. Well, it wasn't so much they as it was Jezebel. Now, I get Jezebel was a queen and she had resources at her disposal. But, but your beef is, or Jezebel has beef with you. It, it's not really like everybody is against you. But, but that's what despair does. Despair distorts reality and speaks inaccurately. And again, I appreciate it, it doesn't require much to appear strong when things are well. You know, it's easy to stand up here in this pulpit and say what Elijah should have done and be an expert uh, uh, in, in Elijah's shortcomings. But the real test of strength is how I bear up in my own adversities. See, because I could sit here, I could stand here and be an expert on Elijah's adversity. Well, Elijah could be an expert on mine. Okay, Brother Cook, when this happened, you should have done A, B, and C. You should have trusted God. Uh, uh, you shouldn't have been worried. Uh, you, you should have did what? Uh, it, it, it's, you know, it, it can go both ways. The wise man says in Proverbs 24, verse 10, If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Now, you want to know what your strength is? Watch how you respond to your adversity in the day of trouble. Not how much of an expert you can be in what somebody else should have done, but watch what you do when it's your turn and, and all I can do is trust God. Elijah says he's the only one left. Now, if you read further, God tells him, look, I have 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Now, you don't have to be good at math to know that one in 7,000, there's a great disparity uh, uh, between those numbers. You know, you, you're the only one. Left. Well, what about the servant you dropped off? Even he ain't serving God no more. It, it's just you left to serve. Critical analysis is easy as commentary. But in our own trying times, we need to remember the words uh, of the apostle. In uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 and 9, we are hard-pressed on every side. Now, that wasn't Paul 
you know, trying to make it seem like it was more than it was. If you've ever read the New Testament, you know Paul suffered some things for the gospel's sake. He says, we are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed. You ever been perplexed? You ever take a math test and have no idea how to get the answer? <laughs> then you've been perplexed. We are perplexed. You ever looked at life and said, man, I have no idea what's going to happen. I don't even know how God is going to get me through this one. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Why didn't you despair, Paul? Why didn't you just lose all hope? Because I remember that in spite of what things look like, God is in control and nothing happens except it be by the determined or the permissive will of God. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. You know, unpleasant things can happen to you in life. That doesn't mean that God has stopped being God. You know, and Paul said, and we're not going to talk foolishly just because we've had to go through some unpleasant things. You ever hear people uh, uh, down God when they go through some unpleasant things? You know, if there is a God, why did he let my relative die? Well, well, why should your family get an exemption? You know, that, that's a part of life. When you were born into this world, at some point, you're going to leave here. Now, I know we don't think about that while things are going well, but, but, but that's the reality. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Now, again, you know, I, I, I don't want to act like our hard times are not hard times, but hard times can be made harder because of despair. I don't doubt for a moment Paul was really going through something, you know, and it wasn't anything just shake your head at, oh, ain't, ain't too much to it. But Paul understood, you, you know, your frame of mind can make it seem worse than it is. And then third this morning, if we read uh, verses 15 and 16, you know, the question be asked, you know, what are you doing here? Elijah didn't realize it, but he had come to receive uh, his working orders. In verse 15, then the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. You haven't been traveling and get turned around and start going in the wrong direction. And it took you a little while to figure out you headed in the wrong direction. Do you know what you have to do once you realize you're in the wrong direction? You got to turn around and go back all the way you had traveled in the wrong direction. So if you go 100 miles in the wrong way, you got to turn around and go back 100 miles just to get back where you were before I started going in the wrong direction. Go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. Now, some estimates say he had not quite 200 miles he had traveled. And appreciate back then they didn't have automobiles. He had traveled all that way by foot. God said, guess what? Turn around and go on back. All the way back, there ain't no shortcut. Turn around and go back. And on your way, when you get there, I want you to anoint Haziel as king over Syria. Also, you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. Uh, and Elisha, the son of she uh, Shaphat of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. God gave him work to do. Elijah was in the call of duty. He had came to get his work in orders. Interestingly enough, Moses had received his call to duty at this same mountain. And the similarities between Elijah and Moses run deep. You remember Moses had fled Egypt having murdered an Egyptian. Elijah had run from Jezebel having put to death the prophets of Baal. When Moses received the law from God, he was there 40 days and 40 nights. Elijah traveled 40 days and 40 nights uh, uh, to the mountain. 
When we consider the call of duty, the call of duty by God speaks to us that life is bigger than us and beyond us. Now, what do you mean bigger than us? The affairs of this world include more than just me. You know, right now, it's some 8 billion people alive in the world. And my life and your life are intertwined with the lives of other people. And when something affects me in some kind of way, it affects others because my life is intertwined with the lives of others. But sometimes we think about things in the context of me, my, I, as if it only pertains to me. Well, whatever happens to you in some kind of way is going to affect somebody else. To say that life is beyond us is to say that we do not and cannot appreciate all the plans and purposes of the omnipotent God. Anybody here want to wrongly assert, I know everything God is doing? The truth be told, we don't know much of what God is doing. And what we do know, either we are able to figure out retrospectively, or we only know because God told us in his word uh, in the first place. You know, we look at God sometimes like children look at their parents. You ever had your child look at you funny or question what you do? Now, they do that because they don't know or understand what you know. Now, let them live a while and have some children, and their children are going to look at them just as crazy as, as, as they're looking at you right now. It's amazing how you change as you mature. Well, in Romans uh, uh, chapter 11, verses 33 and 34, Paul says, Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. See, we just wonder at what God is doing because God knows so much more than we do. We don't begin to understand or know what God understands or God knows. In verse 34, he says, For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? See, Elijah was looking at this event from the limited perspective of what Elijah could see. God was looking at this event as the omnipotent one who was in control of everything. And nothing happens except I want it to or I allow it to. See, When you look at it from God's perspective... In reality, the only thing Jezebel ran was her mouth. See, but God had to refocus Elijah by giving him work to do. Now, I know when we despondent and, and, and discouraged and all of that, you know, we, we like to be buttered up. You, you want somebody just pull your clothes. Come on, boo, it's going to be all right. But, but you notice that's not what God did to Elijah here. God gave Elijah work to do. And I don't doubt for a moment that we all need to be encouraged, uh, especially in times of trouble or trial. But what we never need is for someone to assist us to wallow in our sorrows. You know, we can do a good enough job or a bad enough job of that by ourselves. I don't need somebody to help me feel bad about things not going well. What I need is somebody that's going to help me shoulder up to my cross. And remember that the omnipotent God is still in control despite what my circumstances might be saying. When we ask the question, what are you doing here? I believe there's another context other than what Elijah experienced in this event uh, in 1 Kings 19. I believe every one of us could be asked the question, what are you doing here? And here meaning one of two places. Either I am alive in Christ Jesus, or I am yet dead in my sins. Nobody has to be dead in sin. God has provided the remedy through Christ Jesus for that. Uh, and the remedy that God has provided as revealed in Scripture 
is that number one, God requires that we hear the gospel message. The good news that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried but raised the third day uh, for our justification. Romans 10, 17 declares that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need to hear the gospel message. Having heard the gospel, we must believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, John 8, verse 24. Now, believing that Jesus is the Christ necessitates that we do something about that fact. God requires that we, number one, be willing to repent of sin. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of living. Uh, Acts 17.30, the Bible declares that God requires all men everywhere to repent. But he also requires that we make the confession of faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, as did the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. But even having done that, God requires that we be baptized in water uh, as an obedient response uh, uh, to the gospel message. Uh, 1 Peter 3, verse 20, 21, Peter declares the like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, what Peter was saying there is that when we are baptized as an obedient response to the gospel message, in the waters of baptism, God washes away our sins by the blood of Christ Jesus, puts his spirit inside of us, and then he adds us to the church. When we come up out of the water, the expectation of God, the command of God, is that we live faithfully in his service. Revelation 2.10 says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. If you're listening to this message via one of the social media outlets, you want to be baptized into Christ Jesus, then we bid you reach out to our elders at elders at laurelchurch.net. Uh, they will be happy to assist you. If you are here in our audience and this is your desire, or you want the church to pray for you, then we bid you to come as we stand and as we sing the song of invitation. Hi, this is Ricky Cook, one of the ministers here at the Laurel Church of Christ. We're glad you've chosen to watch our video broadcast. We'd also like to invite you to join us for in-person worship. We have worship services at 8 a.m. and another at 10.30 a.m. every Sunday morning. We also have a worship service in Spanish at 1 p.m. Sunday afternoons. Bible class is on Sunday at 9.30 a.m. And on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., we have Bible class in both English and Spanish. Please know that you're always welcome here. We look forward to seeing you.